100 years ago, the world was in crisis. In 1923, civil wars brewed around the globe. People reeled from the First World War, and it seemed like the soul of society was in doubt. Great thinkers searched for an answer to what they saw as the problem of the human condition. In that year, Khalil Gibran wrote in The Prophet that nature is an internal battlefield between reason and passion. Within a few months of this, Sigmund Freud wrote about our ego and our id. Both men note a duality in us, that humans seem to work at cross purposes. At times, we desire community and connection, and at others, independence or domination. Also that same year came the Jewish answer in a book written by Martin Buber that is one of the most important works of Jewish thought in the last century. Buber emphasized dialogue and relation because while Freud and Gibran saw the struggle as two opposing forces within us, reason and passion, ego and id, Martin Buber saw humans as whole selves and place the struggle not inside us, but in how we can relate to the world. In 1923, Martin Buber was living in a battered Germany. That year saw the highest inflation in the nation's history. It was the year of Hitler's failed attempt to overthrow the government. It was a time of division and uncertainty, a time of fear and hate, and we, the Jewish people, know all too well where it was headed. Into this world, Martin Buber publishes I and Thou, a book that posits that humans have two fundamental kinds of relationships, an I to an it or an I to a you. It, he writes, belongs to the one directional world of experience. What does this thing mean for me? It is something that we hold at a distance, something that we use, something that is other from ourselves. On the other hand, when we encounter a you, we enter a world of relationship. We relate in both directions and recognize that the person across from us is in fact their own self, their own I. In an I-you relationship, we are present with our whole being. We are seen as we see the presence of another. It is not that only I, you relationships can happen with people. They could happen with an idea, with the environment. And of course, Buber called God the eternal you. Unfortunately, most of our lives, writes Buber, are spent in the world of I and it. Relationships, objects, ideas, and people are reduced to merely it, something that we experience but don't try to fully understand. We ourselves, he writes, are too often treated as an it for others and not seen for who we truly are. The path to authentic relationship is what Buber illuminates for his reader. I and thou lays out the underpinnings of his philosophy of dialogue, that one has to make themselves open to another and unguarded before they can hope to have a true I-thou experience. Buber tries to move his reader beyond the objectification of it. It's not that all it relationships are bad. We need them to get through the day or get anything done, but we cannot live only in a world of I's and it's. He closes the first part of his book by saying, listen, without it, a human being cannot live, but whoever lives only with that is not human. This was the message that Martin Buber thought the world of 1923 needed to hear, that if we fail to see the humanity in others, we will lose the humanity in ourselves. Buber is neither the first nor the last to suggest that we should work to recognize the humanity in others. There's a moment in the first few pages of the Talmud, a thousand years before Buber wrote his book, where the rabbis ask, when is it considered light enough to say the morning Shema? Essentially, how much light do we need to say that the day has begun? Rebbe Meir said that it's when there's enough light that you can tell the difference between a dog and a wolf. Rabbi Akiva thinks that you need a little more light and that it's when you can tell the difference between a wild donkey or a domestic one. 
Some of us couldn't do that in any kind of life. <laughs> and then a group of anonymous rabbis known as Acherim, which in Hebrew means others, appear in the text and posit that day begins when you can look at the person next to you via Kir Oto and recognize them and know them. That if you cannot look into the face of another and recognize who they are, then the world is still in darkness. It's fitting that the rabbis who say this are known only as achirim. In their suggestion is perhaps also a plea. They want to be known as more than other. They want and deserve, as we all do, to be recognized. No, Buber did not invent the idea that we desire real relationships. It's been around since the first time humans gathered in a cave. It's the topic of articles and books today. Taylor Swift sings, I'm only me when I'm with you. I mean, the entire Swift songbook is basically one big search for connection. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who chuckled at that. Dr. Emily Nagoski writes that we all need a loving, listening presence in our lives to feel that we are at home. Ted Lasso urges us to be curious and not judgmental about others. The call to authentic connection is not perhaps unique to Buber, but the time in which he lived, the things that he had seen explain what make his words resonant today. Part of what led Buber to his philosophy was the trauma that he knew in his own life. When he was three, his mother left his family. He was sent to live with his grandparents and he never saw her again. He remembers standing in the window trying to get her attention as she walked away without saying goodbye. And he would later write that the realization he would never get that final moment of connection gave him an infinite sense of deprivation and loss. Another incident happened when Buber was already a famous scholar often sought out for wisdom and advice. A young soldier came to his door uninvited, seeking an audience. Now, Buber had spent the morning wrapped in his own religious meditations and prayers, and he writes that he had a hard time being present for this stranger. Buber invited him in, spoke with him as amiably as he did all of his guests, but he didn't have the energy to go deeper. I conversed attentively and openly with him, writes Buber, only I omitted to guess the questions which he did not put. He didn't answer the questions the young man didn't ask. He could tell that something unspoken was there under the surface of their conversation, but he didn't address it. And tragically, he later learned that that man was in real distress. And after leaving Buber's home, the soldier took his own life. Buber would never be the same. How could he? From that moment on, he gave up on personal religious pursuits and devoted himself to fostering connection and relationship between others. Buber lived his life feeling the longing for a mother's embrace that would never come again. The guilt of having ignored the unspoken plea of a stranger in distress. Is there any wonder that he created a philosophy demanding the importance of meaningful relationships? That his life's work was fostering dialogue where two individuals are fully themselves and also fully connected. Buber's work was a warning to all of us not to make the same mistakes of his mother or himself, to find connection, to make ourselves present, even when it is exhausting, in order to save ourselves and our fellows from what he called the horrors of alienation. Each of us knows the pain of alienation. With family or with friends, whether our fault or theirs, human lives are messy and complicated, and sometimes we hurt and are hurt by those closest to us. We know isolation to different degrees, I'm sure, but each of us knows what it is to feel alone. We know what it means to be unseen by others because of who we are, because of how we act, or just because the world around us seems busy and uncaring. No one can avoid these moments. They're part of life, but we all deserve the opportunity to form genuine connections. Even if the opportunity is short-lived, it's important. Buber writes that the I-thou relationship is almost always fleeting. None of us can stay fully tuned to another person forever, but the moments that we connect 
carry us. The strength we expend on relationship comes back to us and sustains us. Buber writes that the moments of supreme encounter are no mere flashes of light in the dark, but like a rising moon on a clear night, they assure the genuine existence of community. An authentic connection may be fleeting, but those moments remind us that we belong somewhere and they give us strength. Now, Buber wrote not only because of his personal struggles, but the struggle of the collective culture of his day. In the divisive and angry times of the early 20th century, where nationalism and economic fear pushed people into warring camps, Buber's call for relationship with the other was nothing less than heroic. It was, in Michael Fishbane's words, an act of spiritual resistance against the political theology of the day. The modern world asks people to think only of themselves. Everything else is reduced to an it, to be feared or to be used. Buber warned that modern man has become too preoccupied with their own feelings, and he fought against this preoccupation and tried to serve the human spirit in inhuman times. He urged people not to give in to the forces of tribalism and fear. Knowing what we do about what happened in the decades after Buber published his work, would that more people had listened. His call for connection in the 20s went unheeded in his time. I pray that we hear his words in ours, because certainly we have just as great a need for spiritual resistance, for spiritual strength today. Like 100 years ago, there are many things in the world today that prevent us from achieving an I-Thou relationship. In his day, new technologies had a role in fraying the fabric of community. Today, too, technology both connects us and keeps us apart. We're more networked than ever before, but those connections serve to alienate and harm us. The promise of social media is supposed to be one of connection. There are millions of opportunities to create deep relationships because we can see and be seen by so many. But the reality is that we are all turned into perpetual its, being used for likes and looks and data. The relationships that we can foster, the information at our fingertips can be forces of good, but they can just as easily make us feel left out and more alone than ever. In Buber's day, identity was a driver of division. So too, we live in a world of many identities and many divisions. Whether they are race or sexuality, gender or geography, heritage or education, or a myriad of others, the things that make us unique, that should make us proud, are often things that isolate us from those who are not the same. According to the American Psychological Association, a full two-thirds of Americans report feeling lonely on any given day. And those percentages go up among people with financial struggles, older adults, teens, and members of the LGBTQ community. Studies have shown that rates of loneliness correlate to increased mental and physical health risks. Simply put, the horrors of alienation have lasting physical effects. We are, at all of the, uh, we are all of us at times lonely, and we are all of us at times able to cure the loneliness of others. We should create a world where everyone can feel seen and celebrated for who they are. We should have the courage to share ourselves with those around us. Identity should be a force of shared joy and experience, not division and discord. And perhaps, no identity is more divisive today than one's political affiliation. Politics are so polarized that it not only divides us, but can make us hateful. Whatever position on a spectrum we occupy, we see those on the opposite side as so fundamentally other that they're worthy of contempt or worse, to be ignored. And the problem isn't punditry and the media, it's that we have lost the ability to disagree while staying connected at the same time. Too often we hear someone espouse a view we don't like, and we label it and dismiss it. Into this breach, Buber's I Thou dialogue could be a bridge. When we disagree, we shouldn't reduce that which we dislike to an it. It is a problem. It is wrong and stupid. It is canceled. It can be hated. It can be forgotten. But there are, in truth, very few its walking around, just individuals. Yes, there may be some bad faith actors in our world, but on the whole, we are people. Democrats and Republicans are not demons, they are humans. 
They're formed through the same course of nature and nurture, failures and flaws, hopes and dreams that make each of us who we are. We can and should disagree. We can and should stand up for what we believe in, but if we do not take the time to understand one another, then like the others in the Talmud assert, the world is still in darkness. The world of 2023 is as fractious and alienating as 1923, as packed with things that prevent us from having authentic relationships, even though relationship is needed more than ever. A hundred years ago, Buber told us that we need to see the other or else we lose our humanity. A hundred years later, I fear that we face the same danger. We need to find spiritual strength to listen to others, to get comfortable being uncomfortable, to put down our armor and vulnerably walk into real relationships with friends, with others, and even those we might not like. It can be difficult, and it might be scary, but it is also perhaps the most important thing that any of us individuals can do for a world of too many its and not enough yous. Today on Rosh Hashanah, we begin the process of repentance and reproachment for our sins of the year gone by. Surely a part of that process must be thinking about the people that we have failed to connect with this year. Whether intentionally or because we couldn't see beyond ourselves, we have failed to make connections this year. For the year to come, we should make a commitment to connection. It isn't easy, and it shouldn't be easy. It will involve setting aside energy to engage with others, setting aside time to be present for people we love. It will involve setting aside insecurities and fears to engage with people we disagree with. And perhaps hardest of all, it will, it will involve setting aside our screens to be whole for the person across from us. This is the job of each one of us as we do better at seeing others next year. Creating authentic relationships and fostering dialogue, these are also the responsibility of a synagogue. A synagogue is a place of gathering, of belonging, a place committed to its members from birth to burial where they will always have a home. It is a sacred task that I know this synagogue takes seriously. Our community has grown over this past year, and we will continue, please God, to welcome new members in the year to come. We will work to ensure that everyone is welcome, that while this may be our house, it is your home. We have embarked on strategic plans, and we will keep updating our programs and prayers and professionals, but the real superpower of this community is and always has been each one of you. In my year here, I have seen remarkable acts of kindness and inclusion, of welcoming and caring for one another in good times and bad, and that is what makes this a truly remarkable place to belong. In the year ahead, we should double down on the relationships that we build here, on being a community that sees you for who you are and makes sure that you belong. The dues to membership at our shul should not only be a financial commitment, but a commitment to caring and curiosity about everyone who walks in those doors. There are many reasons that one might look around and say that the world is darkening. Some of them were present in 23, 1923, and some of them are new. It might seem paltry or naive to look at the problems we face today and say that authentic relationship, that dialogue, will be the thing that saves us, but it is in fact the greatest thing that we all have in our power to do. We can dig deep and find our ability to be vulnerable, to be curious. We can strengthen our compassion and make connections. A hundred years ago, philosophers sought answers to the human condition and they found them in different places. Freud found the answer within. Gibran dreamt of a, of a prophet on a hill bestowing wisdom from on high. Buber found sanctity in relationship. He found it in the interactions between people and others, between people and the earth, between people and God. It is the relation that brings holiness, and it is the relation that is up to us. Buber's philosophy is both daunting and empowering. It is Herculean, yes, but it also means that the power is in our hands, the power to bring real relationship to the people in our lives, each one of us by being present, by shining a light so that the person across from us is seen and known and no longer other. Then we can declare that night has ended and day begun. Shana Tovah.